Um, again, one of the things that I had, uh, the, the marine bio 101, physical oceanography 101 stuff, some of that has disappeared that I, and I don't understand why. So um, in particular, the first few parts of that. So I'm re-recording this for you guys. I recorded it offline, but you know, whatever, we'll go for it again. It's all good. Um, but this is actually a, a much more uh, sort of participatory, or it should be a much more participatory uh, thing than me just recording it offline. So I just want to re-record this first part of this introduction that um, followed on from the two weeks ago um, uh, ice experiment you did with in your fridge and with your ice cubes. Okay, so let's get going. So um, let's just talk a little bit about the context of our coastal ocean, the context of our water planet, and uh, the importance of, uh, of essentially water to uh, life on Earth and to the, the goings on that we have on our planet. All right, so uh, when we look at the Earth, we, or when we think about the Earth, we sometimes think of the terrestrial side of things because we are so um, of the land. Makes total sense, that's our bias. Obviously the coastal zone as we've defined it includes both the land and the ocean, but I wanna focus um, for right now just on the ocean side of the world because that is really the vast majority of our planet. So we really do live on a water planet, not a, not a terrestrial, not a dry planet. Um, now, uh, I'll give you guys a second. If you're uh, on some old computer or, 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 or bad bandwidth or whatever, it might be a little hard to see, but on this right side over here, um, there's an image. It, any, anybody wanna guess what this image is on the, uh, on the right over here or what we're looking at? those underwater lights okay good guess total good guess could be something underwater excellent what else or, or what else could it be anybody How about emma I've stunned everyone into silence. No one can possibly think of what this thing is. It's like one of those color paintings from the eighties that are random <laughs> on people's walls. It's like, it's like a seventies mood ring. It's like the thing you got in your cereal box and it told you if you were happy or not. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, could be, could be. Any of the last guesses before we, we hit the button? Um, is it like a light spectrum or an aurora? Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. So, great question. Sure. I remember mean, you got quite a question, but, but great right. guess. Yeah, definitely has that look about it, right? We were sort of seeing um, a band of color and then a different color, then a, a different color, then a different color. So yeah, that's a, that's a great guess. And that's actually fairly close to what this is. So I'm actually most curious here about the little teeny, th little teeny speck in there. And so what I've done is on the left, I've zoomed into that little speck and that's that's the part that's on the left, uh, magnified. So obviously there's some pixelation going on there, um, but uh, what that is, is an image from Voyager oh, 1. So Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were the first mm -hmm. objects that we sent out beyond our solar system, out into the interstellar void, and they're still traveling. They're, actually, I, I thought, we were getting our last transmission, but my dad told me last week that uh, we're supposed to get, it's supposed to, it's supposed to last for another few months or year or so before we actually completely lose them. But what's going on is, so if you guys were too young to remember what the Voyagers were, these were uh, probes launched in the 1970s. And these were shot out uh, to look at essentially the, the outer reaches of our solar system. So they, they did flybys of many planets and and swooped around and, and took uh, uh, data and then transmitted that data back to Earth. They have on board a radiation source that acts as their source of electricity because they're so far out, you can't use solar panels. Um, 
and uh, they went and they, they swooped around the planets and they did all their visits and everything. And then they did their final slingshot and they're, they're just shooting out into um, outer space. And so I don't normally read quotes, but I'm gonna read a quote here. Uh, I always read this one quote. Um, and this is from Carl Sagan, who actually used this in a lecture um, just after I, I, I graduated from my undergraduate uh, degree. And so this is Carl Sagan on October 13th, 1994. Um, and he was given a public lecture, he was given a seminar at Cornell University. And he showed these images from Voyager 1. And when this, okay, so let me explain this again. So um, what happened was, uh, it was, Voyager 1 was heading on out and it's, you know, looking forward, but sort of almost on a whim, they, they paused and they spun the craft around, the, the, the spacecraft around and looked backwards. Normally it's been, it was you know, looking forward to the planets and the things it was encountering. Um, and at this point, it was 4 billion miles from Earth. And it looked back and it, and it took a shot. And, and there was no, it was just like, what the heck, right? Why don't we just try this? There, there, was, there wasn't, wasn't part of a rigorous study or anything like that. It was like, can this happen? And it just so happened, it just so happened that um, it worked. And so this is looking straight back home. And so, so the quote is, <clears throat> um, uh, Earth is what we're seeing here. So this little blue dot is us, is you, is me. So in this, in this light gray band, in this lighter colored band here, in the middle of that, right here, this is what Earth lo looks like from four billion miles away. And in, the, in his lecture, Sagan said, um, we succeeded in taking that picture, this picture, from deep space. And if you look at it, you see a dot. Uh, that's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being is ever, who's ever lived, um, every entity that's ever lived out its life, the aggregate of all our joys and sufferings, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, Every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint, every sinner in the history of our species lived here on this little moat of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is very small in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and in triumph, they could become momentary masters of a small fraction of this little dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited on visited on the inhabitants of one corner of this dot on scarcely distinguishable inhabitants from some other corner of the dots. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturing, our self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of small, pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will ever come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. It's up to us. It's been said that astronomy is humbling and I might add a character building experience. To my mind, there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of humans' conceits that this distant image, than this distance, this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. And so, so he called this the pale blue dot. He went on to write a book called The Pale Blue Dot. And so that's it, right? The earth doesn't look brown here. The earth looks blue here. The magic part of this showing up is the fact that we are a water planet. The water is capturing the, the light of the sun and just happens to, to get the right angle and reflect back to us. That's what we're seeing here from this picture from 1990. So when we talk about uh, our water planet, um, before we, we go on to talk about specifically what's going on, on 
going on on our planet. I want to just first make sure we understand that that water is is a unique thing. Water, water is a precious thing, and uh, it it in the case of solar exploration, solar system exploration, it's where we focus a lot of our attention for two reasons. One, because we think we can turn water into something useful, i.e. fuel, hydrogen fuel, let's say. The other reason is that um, water is really the cradle of life. And so while there's no guarantee that life elsewhere evolved the same way and followed the same pathways as life has done here on earth, you know, as a starter, that's what we like to focus on. So for example, whenever we find water in other places, it's huge news. So in this case, this is a crater on Mars, and this is um, a relatively small crater. Why am I not advancing here? Uh, this is a relatively small crater, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's only 35 kilometers wide. And what we think is going on here, this is, this is a um, uh, artificially enhanced image. So, this is, so the, this is colored to make it easier for us to see. But what we see along the lip over here, right, is some fr what, what appears to be, uh, fr looks like ice in this, in this uh, false color image. And here in the middle, uh, a, a puddle of something frozen. And so this seems to be consistent with the fact that this is a relatively deep crater and this is relatively shaded from the sunlight. So we have evidence of water on Mars. Other uh, evidence of water being on Mars. So this is, uh, as we look down here, we're looking at uh, one of the Mars rovers who's gone and, 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 and taken a, a little shovel, a little automated shovel, taken a scoop of soil to, to grab some soil to put into um, one of its uh, processors to look at what the chemical composition of the soil is. And if we look at this, what you see is these are on different days. So, so soul is what we call a day. Uh, so so um, uh, rotations of the, of the sun, right? And so they might be different times uh, because of the, the orbits and the, and the rotations of different planets. So we use soul when we're off the earth. And so what's going on here is on the left-hand image, um, we've scooped and we've taken out a chunk of the soil and we took a picture of it because why not? And, and done the processing of the soil. But then when a second picture was taken of the same exact spot four souls later, what we see is if you look really close, you'll see what looks like crystals on the left and then, or, or light colored squares or something. And then on the right, it's gone. So the interpretation of this has been that um, that was quite possibly some frozen water just subsurface as we exposed it to the, the wind and, and, and the atmosphere, it essentially evaporated and is gone. That, that's why it, it differed between those two images. Everything else is the same. There isn't, there isn't a bunch of dust that blew in or anything of that nature. So the more we look essentially, the more we find that water is around uh, in the universe and in our own solar system. Uh, we also see evidence of, and again, this is on Mars, this is some more recent data, this is a few years after those last images, but what we see is we step through uh, the year here from some, some um, uh, satellite-based images of this part of Mars, we see what, what looks a lot like um, running liquid, right? So, so it looks very reminiscent of, like I say, a rainstorm or something, and then we saw the stuff wash down. So yet more evidence of or, or while well, this isn't direct evidence of water, this is consistent with water being frozen, being thawed at different times of the year on Mars. And then um, some other really cool stuff. So this is the moon um, Enceladus uh, on, and this is from Cassini, the Cassini um, uh, orbiter. And um, what we're looking at here, we just happen to take a picture of, you know, at, towards the horizon of this moon. And what you see is you see all these jets. And while we're not entirely sure what those are, one of the um, uh, current speculations comes from a paper in 2014 that actually there's a frozen crust over Enceladus. And actually there, there could well be liquid, um, a liquid ocean underneath that ice. And that what we're seeing there, those jets of those, those ejecta, those, those, those puffs coming out, um, could be cracks in the ice, et cetera. And um, this might be very similar to some of our deep sea vent or potentially could have a situation similar to some of our deep sea vents in the bottoms of our oceans here on earth. 
Okay, so that's a lot to say simply that um, water is precious. And when we look for life around the universe, one of our key um, uh, searching terms or searching tools is to, is to find water and find abundant water. We've, 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 we're, we're finding more and more water as we look around, but it's, not, it's nowhere near as abundant as water is on Earth. So, water really, uh, so Earth really does seem to be this magic place from our experience, at least our, our, our limited nearby cosmic experience. Um, so this is our world. And this is, a, this is a compilation of images where we've done some magic and we've taken the clouds away. So this is, this is, these are real images, but, but the atmospheric um, uh, obstructions have been removed. And so in this part, for example, just below Australia and above Antarctica, uh, you know, this huge, most of what we're seeing here is blue. Most of what we're seeing here is surface water. So 71% of the surface of the earth is covered by water. Um, and these are great questions for a quiz. Hint, hint. These, these are great things to know. These, these, are, these are really, uh, I, don't, I don't focus on factoids too much, but these are really important ones that you guys should all know. Um, because these, these are, have lots of implications when we're engaging in conversation with people about the coastal ocean, about the, our water planet. So you should definitely know that 71% of the earth is covered by water. Um, most of the earth is, most of the ocean, excuse me, is relatively deep. So about 3.7 kilometers average depth. The deepest part is near an American territory uh, in the place called the Challenger Deep, which is one part of the Mariana Trench. In that area, going from the surface to where you touch the bottom crust of the ocean, it's over 11 kilometers deep. That is, that is a, a pitch straight down, man. That is, that, that's really, really, really far. Uh, if we talk about um, how much water is in the world's ocean, the vast, 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 vast majority of the water on our water planet is in our salty ocean, in our marine environment. Very little is in the poles, very little is in fresh groundwater or, or, or freely flowing on the surface like in rivers or a lake or something of that nature. Um, so the global ocean is deep on average. The global ocean is also very cold on average. So the average temperature of the earth Excuse me, of the, I keep saying of the, earth. the average temperature, temperature of the Earth's ocean, our global ocean, is three degrees Celsius. So just a little bit above freezing. So most of the water is dark, deep, and cold. We've had a contiguous ocean on Earth. So recall that Earth is a bit older than 4 billion years old, about 4.2 billion years or so. Um, but we've had an ocean for the vast, 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 vast majority of the history of our planet, right? So um, while the oceans have changed, we've had tectonic activity and the basins have shifted and this and that, but we've had some type of, of water on, in liquid form on the surface of the earth for um, more than almost three and a half billion years. That's a long time to allow innovation to evolve and, and change and, and do all kinds of funky stuff. The largest feature on Earth, the largest geological feature on Earth is the Oceanic Ridge, which is essentially a mountain chain that, that goes, a sub, sub sea underwater mountain chain that, that wraps around. We can't see that very easily because it's underwater, but that is geologically the most uh, conspicuous thing. Um, and the largest mountain on Earth is Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So everybody talks about um, you know Everest and, and K2 and all those are huge mountains, but those are we call it, we think those are the largest because we're measuring them from where we can see. We can see the base of the mountain. We can see the top of the mountain. If we actually talk about uh, Mauna Kea. Right? Mauna Kea is still huge, it's still a massive mountain. That's one of the reasons why we have some of the controversies we have going on now with the native Hawaiians and the observatories that are there. The observatories were located on, on these, these tall mountains because one, it's in the middle of the Pacific, and so it's free from light pollution and it's relatively clean atmosphere and all this and that, relatively high. Um, and it's very, it's very, very high. And so, um, 
we think of that height though, right, from the beach in Hawaii to the top of the, of the um, ridge point, the apex part of the mountain. But in reality, right, that mountain's like this and the beach is here, that mountain continues down underwater to the base of the ocean. So when you measure it that way, it's, it's over 10 kilometers high, that mountain, even though the air part of the mountain is only about four kilometers high. Okay, 71% of the ocean, 71% of the surface is ocean. Um, the average depth is pretty deep, not quite four kilometers in depth. Uh, Marianas Trench, specifically the Challenger Deep, is the deepest part of the ocean. And the ocean is very cold on average, very close to freezing. Um, and then, and then this is just a little breakdown. You can take our water resources class if you guys are curious about this. But so now notice here, here I said, uh, where did I say this? 96.5% of the earth is, is water, uh, of the earth's water is in the ocean. This figure here says 97.3. When we start calculating these numbers, the exact average temperature of the earth, the exact volume of water here versus it gets, you start to get into a lot of assumptions. And so, so the exact percentages will vary slightly depending on who's doing the calculation or what data set they use. If they're doing a geospatial thing, if they're doing a, uh, a first order approximation type thing. But, um, but the key notion here is the vast, 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 vast majority, whether it's 97 or 96% is in the ocean and a fleetingly small amount is on the surface and relatively easy for us to access them. Access it. Okay. Uh, next, uh, just sort of continuing off of that experiment that we that you guys all did. Um, key part here about why we have all this interesting ecology, why we have these interesting resource management challenges, uh, has to do with the physics of water, the chemistry of water. Water, hydrogen, and oxygen is is held together by two main forces. So one of the hydrogen bonds, which act to hold, to make sort of water molecules sticky and, 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 to, and act to, to make them stick to one another, pull them together like this, so that's an attractive force. The other is a repulsive force, and that is where the molecules are, are vibrating so much they don't wanna, they wanna sh you know, shake themselves apart. So we talk about kinetic energy, or you can also talk about thermal energy. So hydrogen bonds are acting to hold our water molecules together. Heat is acting to push those water molecules apart. Three states of water. Now here's the cool thing about Earth. We've, as we saw, um, you know, we, we have now evidence of some frozen water. So ice on Mars and on some areas of the moon and, and some places here and there. Um, the cool thing about Earth, or one of the, the magical things about Earth, is that we don't just have some ice, we don't just have some water, right? We don't just have some gaseous water vapor. We have all three of these phases at the same time, on the same place, interacting with one another in abundance. Okay, so what's ice? Ice, in this context, is the low temperature limit of of our, of our substance called water, H2O. We have ice when the hydrogen bonds are stronger, the pulling together is stronger than the heat energy trying to pull, pull us apart. Ice makes a regular lattice structure uh, because of the chemical, because of the orientation. Now this is a three-dimensional process. I'm showing it right here as a, as a two-dimensional thing because it's on our flat screen, but these water molecules are pocked are, are, are packing together in a lattice when they're frozen, that they're, they're maximally distanced from one another. And this is what was going on uh, partly in our, um, our example, our, our, our kitchen experiment. And, and when we have these other impurities, they get in the way and they make these brine pockets. That was the heart of that exercise we did. Okay, now that was that three-dimensional display of ice. Now I'm just shrinking it down for purposes of, of diagramming it I'm making it a two-dimensional thing, even though, again, ice is a three-dimensional lattice. So what we see here is the, and each of the yellows would be a, a water molecule. Um, we have this regular array or this lattice work array of molecules. Um, the next thing we can do is we can add a little more heat. And so liquid is the intermediate uh, 
phase of matter of, of water. And so this is where the hydrogen bonds, the squeezing together forces are roughly equal to the shoving away uh, forces of heat. And so this is gonna tend to have some, some organized groupings of water, but they're kind of interspersed here and there with sort of free water, with, with free, freely moving water. So we get some semblance of these, of these sort of sticky structures, but it's not a perfect lattice. It's not a regular, it's not evenly distributed throughout that way. And so obviously you see the image on the right here. And the third example, or the third state is where, where um, actually the hydrogen bonds are, are doing very little, right? And the thermal energy is driving the show. So now these, these energetic uh, water molecules are bouncing, 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 and they're, and they're bouncing off each other and they're, and they're very distant and they are in no way, shape or form any type of, um, in any kind of lattice. And so these are more or less independent molecules now that are bumping off each other. They're not interacting the way they would in water or in um, ice. Okay, why did I do all that? Why did we just talk about that? Because the, this aspect and, and the, the association of water molecules to other water molecules produces some of these key properties of water that in turn lead us to the ocean that we have and in turn lead to the type of life and resource abundance that, that we, um, we know and love. So what is, how, does, how does that uh, work? Well, um, the first thing we see is that water has a lot of thermal inertia, okay? So we can express that in a couple different ways. They're all different flavors, uh, variants of the same flavor. So um, uh, heat capacity, this is, you know, technically speaking, this is how much energy we have to add to one gram of water uh, to raise it one degree Celsius. Water has an incredibly high heat capacity. Ammonia is, only, is the only known naturally occurring substance, abundantly occurring substance, that has a higher heat capacity than water. This heat capacity is gonna allow thermal buffering, it's gonna allow uh, energy to be moved around in ocean basins and do all kinds of cool stuff. So this is, you know, why, um, why uh, the East Coast is, is relatively warm, right? This is why uh, Great Britain isn't as cold as it otherwise, quote unquote, should be based on where it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, latitudinally on the earth and so on and so forth. Also related to this is this latent heat of fusion. This is, um, uh, this is the same idea, right? And uh, again, only ammonia has a higher latent heat of fusion than does water. Again, helps with this thermal buffering, helps with moving of energy around the planet. Uh, latent heat of evaporation. This is the heat that, um, or the amount of energy that it takes to raise one gram of water at 100 degrees C uh, to turn it from water into water vapor. This is the highest of all known substances in terms of the, the latent heat of evaporation. Again, really helping with the transferring of energy from water to the atmosphere, et cetera. Um, we can see this manifest in things like hurricanes and things like uh, 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 cyclonic activity and so on and so forth. So there's the thermal inertia, right? The water that has, has one particular temperature, it likes to stay in that temperature. You have to add a lot of energy to get it to do a state shift, okay? That's thermal inertia. Then we can talk about thermal expansion. Um, so, this we're talking here about the density of water right that's what you guys were doing we took that ice cube think of think of that experiment you did you took an ice cube threw it in water and what happened it floated right hopefully yes that's everybody's drooling nobody's paying attention yeah. yes okay good oh thank god Whew, thank god the ice floated oh my god Whew. um i think about that I would swear right now, but then someone gets some extra credit points. But that is blanking insane. What else does that? Virtually nothing else does that. If you had liquid steel and you took a steel girder and you threw that steel girder on there, the steel girder is going to sink. Boom. If you had liquid you know, lava, if you, had, if you had liquid rock there and we threw a, a big giant new boulder in there, that boulder is not going to float on top of the lava. It's going to sink down. 
So what happens with water, because of the packing, because of this, this organization, the geometry of the hydrogen bonds, the, the hydrogen interacting with the oxygen, it is actually less dense when it's a solid than when it's a liquid. That's crazy talk. That's totally crazy. So it actually gets its maximum density when it's a liquid, it's kind of getting cooler, 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 and it's behaving like regular substances. As we get, as we get more towards the solid phase, we're getting more dense, we're getting more dense, we're getting more dense, we're getting more dense. But then once it hits four degrees Celsius, instead of continuing to get more dense as we get towards zero, it actually, it actually reverses, right? And the, the ice, the ice of the bonds make these sort of rigid, rigid um, uh, structures, these lattices, and they force the water to be less dense. Therefore, ice floats. That's crazy. That's crazy. And so that's why ice, ice floats. To us, it seems, of course, ice floats. What are you, stupid? But look around at the rest of, rest of chemistry, the rest of physics, or the rest of the universe, and that is a very strange thing. Um, now, uh, so let's talk about what these things mean. Why, why are we talking about all this stuff in, in our coastal management class? Because they, they have relevance. It has, it has relevance. So here's one small example. This is the day-night temperature differences. So this is looking down at the earth and we've taken some satellite images here and we're talking about the, the number of degrees difference, okay, from midnight to noon. So stare at this and somebody tell me, somebody explain to me the pattern you're seeing here. There's a lot of temperature change over the lands and not a lot over the ocean. Exactly. Exactly, right? So the ocean is basically white or light blue, meaning the day to night difference is just, is, is either non-existent or it's just a degree or two. Whereas when we talk about uh, Saharan Africa, we talk about Asia, we talk about the Southwest, the air, colors there are much hotter, right? Really, really hotter. So that's saying that the, um, that's saying that there's huge swings day versus night. Right, we know that we, we're we're either here in Ventura right now, Ventura County, or you guys can remember the time when you're in Ventura County if you're at your other home somewhere else. Right, um, the coast is relatively mild, right, compared to inland, compared to the Central Valley, compared to New Mexico, compared to Colorado, right. And one of the reasons why we have such a a, a chill temperature, chill. I shouldn't. That's that's the wrong term for this lecture. Such a um, a moderate temperature is the ocean, is this massive thermal battery that's right next to us. So it, yes, we do get hot. It, of course, it's possible to get hot at the coast. Yes, of course, it's possible to get cold at the coast. But on average, the fact that we have this big giant thermal battery living off of, off of our homes and schools and, and places of work here mean that the temperature swings much, much less than uh, as we go inland, as we remove ourselves from the global ocean. Other unique aspects of water. Um, how are we doing on time here? Other unique aspects of water here. Um, uh, the, the dissolving power of water. Absolutely incredible. Totally, totally incredible. So we usually refer to water as the universal solvent because it does such a fantastic job at dissolving such a wide range of other substances. And this ability to, to dissolve other things are, it is one of the key reasons why it is so important in our chemistry, in your chemistry, in my chemistry, in the chemistry of the bacterium over there, uh, of the fungus over there, you know, wherever, wh whatever we wanna talk about. So this water really serves as a key um, uh, facilitator for all kinds of biological and geochemical uh, uh, reactions and physiology, metabolisms, etc. Um, yeah, right. So, so uh, uh, this notion of a solvent is really important for all all manner of things in the ocean. Another cool thing about water is it's transparent. Right again, another to, for us we're like yeah no dude it's no no expletive deleted dude it's clear. The reason it looks clear to us is because our eyes have evolved in a water world, right? So um, so the fact that it can uh, uh, absorb some and block other 
bands of electromagnetic radiation um, informs how the rest and, 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 and structured how the rest of life evolved to, to deal with electromagnetic radiation. So in the case of heat or infrared radiation, lit water is going to absorb most of that. It's gonna, it, infrared doesn't go very far into water. Okay. The visual spectrum from about 400 to 700 nanometers, what you and I see is yellows and greens and blues and reds. Those colors um, actually transmit very well, comparatively speaking, through water. Once we get to the other side, so infrared, no. The visual spectrum, yes. Once we get to the other end of that, the ultraviolet spectrum, not so much anymore. So water has this really um, uh, 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 permissive zone of electromagnetic radiation that lets it that, that, that uh, it allows through. Okay, uh, just to finish up this stuff about seawater here, um, let's talk about the composition of seawater. If we talk about it, if we just go down to the to the coast, Point Magoo, scoop up some a bucket of water, bring it into the lab. This is essentially what we'd find. The vast majority is, of course, water, H2O, the so-called universal solvent that we've just discussed. Actually, let me pause. So I've, I've, just, I've just gone through a bunch of things. Th those make sense, you guys? So again, the key things is thermal inertia, thermal expansion, which makes ice float, the, the, the universal solvent aspect of it, and its uh, selective ability to allow electromagnetic radiation to go through. Are we good on that? Anybody have any questions about that? Or anybody wondering anything about those elements of water or those aspects of water, those properties of water? I had a question about the map. Yeah, sorry, so somebody go. Um, with the heat map, what was causing, because like it didn't, the temperatures didn't look as tied to like the equator as you might expect. So is that like, depth of the ocean in that spot or oh i'm sorry you're talking about the the equator the, the ocean equator yeah um yeah so if, if so yeah i mean so on average the equator is still the warmest part of the earth right and the poles are still the coldest part of the earth on average so you see that on land where the starkest differences are equatorial you know the, the band around the equator on land and then as we start to go up into say northern europe or north america that sort of breaks down a bit, right? The big, the big uh, strangeness is in middle South America, right here, in middle Africa, right around here, and in uh, Indonesia, in, in this area of the Pacific, of the Indo-Pacific. Life is messing with these things. So these are all, we have these, these large um, um, rainforesty, uh, 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 highly uh, abundant, um, water off giving evapotranspiring plant communities. And the same thing up here on this part of, this is a, these are our temperate rainforests, our temperate rainforests are up here. So life is messing with the terrestrial stuff a bit in terms of a, a super crisp, clear signal. Meaning if, there, if we set off a nuclear bomb right now and killed everything on earth and then took this image, you know, a year or so after that, this red would be more extent, this red would extend farther up. Um, so, so we do see the effect of the equator here on land. Now, if we talk about the effect of the equator on the ocean, the question would be maybe why don't we see, um, why don't we see as dramatic a, a change in the, um, uh, or, or why don't we see as much of an effect of the, uh, say, sunlight striking the middle, uh, the, the, the shallow water and, ch and changing that? And the answer there is simply because the ocean is circulating all the time. So the ocean is moving all the time. So if we pick, if we, I'm just gonna pick a random spot. If we pick this little pixel where my arrow is right now, or let me, let me do that differently. So if I pick this part of Africa where my pixel, where my arrow is, that, let's say that, that chunk, of that one square meter that we're sensing with a sensor, the 10 square meters or whatever it is, um, it's getting sun, 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 or if it's at night, it's getting uh, 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 no sun, and then even less sun, and then even less sun, and even less sun. So it's, it's cooling rapidly, right? Whereas this, this little chunk of water here, this is, it's not static like the rocks. It's not, it's not, it's not unmoving. It's not, it's not sitting there getting sun, sun, sun. It's sitting there for a minute getting sun, 
and then the currents are tumbling it and maybe it's going to go underwater or maybe it's going to go more north or go more south. So we have this constant replenishing, this constant movement. It's, it's, a, it's a dynamic medium, all the oceans, whereas the land doesn't have that. So that's the main reason why we see a stronger effect of the, uh, in terms of this day-night differences, we see a stronger effect on the land uh, as compared to the ocean. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Cool. Number next, somebody else had a question. No. Anybody else? Everything makes sense? Inertia, expansion, dissolving, transparent? Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. So then let's keep, let's keep uh, going to finish this little part here. Okay. So those are all the key aspects of water. So you should know those. You, need, you should know those. You should know the basic aspects of the ocean, the, the basic factoids of depth and temperature and all this and that. Okay, uh, so let's talk about what, what's actually in our seawater. The vast majority is the water itself, right, H2O. Then we have stuff that is um, uh, suspended. What does suspended versus dissolved means? Who the hell knows? It's an arbitrary classification. Suspended essentially means a chunk of something, a piece of something. And generally speaking, when we talk about suspended, we mean, uh, it's taken to mean that that object, piece of wood, a sliver, piece of paper, piece of plastic, whatever, is, is small. And so it can, it's moving around as the water is moving, right? It's not a boulder that's, that's falling through the water and sitting on the bottom of the ocean. So it's, it's in the water column but it is, um, uh, it's not necessarily chemically interacting with uh, a lot of the water intensively, right? So we have an arbitrary def definition, which is about a little, uh, it's about 0.45 microns. I don't know why we use that particular definition, but it's one that's been settled on long ago. And so uh, suspended material is stuff that's about half a micron or larger. Stuff that's smaller than that is usually referred to as the dissolved material. Of the dissolved stuff, which is where all the interesting chemistry is happening, of the dissolved stuff, we have several key components you should know about. One is the major constituents. The major constituents are generally the same pretty much anywhere we go, by and large. There's little teeny differences, but by and large, these numbers are pretty solid. If we're in India, if we're in um, the Mediterranean, if we're in the Antarctic, wherever. So we have uh, 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 chlorine, sodium, sulfates, magnesium, calcium, potassium, and um, some of these uh, 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 baking soda-like uh, 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 compounds. And so, uh, for example, the, the chlorine is pretty consistently right around 19%, and so on and so forth. So as we look here, we're, we're going from water is the biggest thing, then we have suspended stuff. Suspended could be dead tissue, suspended could be you know, shells, all kinds of stuff. Dissolved material, and the, of the dissolved material, there's still a small proportion of the elements that really make up the majority of these major constituents. Then we have these so-called minor or trace constituents, and those are, those are a whole variety of possible things they vary, can vary quite a lot depending on where we are in the ocean. Then we have uh, nutrients, which are key for primary production, key, key compounds, molecules um, that are um, really necessary to drive a lot of growth. Um, these are typically on the order of, if the, con the concentration of these substances is typically on the order of 10, 20 or so parts per million. Um, and they include nitrates, nitrites, and ammonia, the different forms of, of uh, nitrogenous uh, materials, uh, phosphates, and uh, silicon or silicon, di silicon oxides, especially silicon dioxide in particular. So when we hear things about, oh my God, we have a nutrient bloom or we have an algal bloom, that's typically going to be uh, nitrogen, where it's not nitrogen, it's typically going to be phosphorus, where it's not one of those two, it's typically going to be um, a silicon-driven phenomenon. And so, uh, so we have reduced primary productivity. Um, one of the first things you would probably think about is, hey, are we having 
um, are we having a, a, a lower level of say nitrates than we would normally think we'd have? Or if we're seeing an algal bloom, an explosion of productivity, um, are we seeing a, an augmentation of the concentration of these nutrients, right? And so we typically think about that in terms of wastewater, humans dumping substances, which then wash into on the street and the street washes into the storm drain, storm drain washes on the coastal ocean, et cetera. And at each of those levels, the concentration goes up. And so we might see uh, uh, algal blooms or we've come to refer to as harmful algal blooms in our coastal waters. Uh, now we also, then we also have some gases that are dissolved, little bubbles of air, just like what we're in your, um, when we look at the ice cube, the ice cube, if you remember, looks very white. That whiteness comes from the, the, the air bubbles, the air pockets in there, same kind of idea. So we have pockets of gas in our water, just like our atmosphere, nitrogen is the most common uh, gas dissolved in the global ocean, uh, then comes oxygen, then comes carbon dioxide. And obviously with climate change, we're working very, very hard and we've been working very hard for a century and a half to really try to screw with the concentration of CO2, to really increase the amount of CO2. Um, we're doing everything we possibly can. Um, certain, certain folks really wanna see us uh, do a massive experiment and continue our massive experiment on our one earth to see how crazy it would get if we start to screw with productivity and things like that in the ocean. Uh, and then we have uh, organics. So that, that's basically stuff from living animals that have died or living organisms that have died. And that can be highly variable. I should say, I should say, okay, I mentioned the nutrients can be variable, particularly near um, terrestrial areas, right, where we have the source of runoff. Gases are also highly variable. Gases, though, are primarily varied from the surface waters where they tend to be relatively, uh, there tends to be a lot of gas that dissolve. And as we go deeper, 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 there tends to be less and less gas on average. Organics, it's gonna really vary depending on where we are in terms of where the most life is. So you'll tend to get a lot of organics at the bottom of an ocean, right? Where that stuff is raining down, for example. And so the water right next to the, the sediment surface will tend to be relatively high in organics. Uh, similarly, next to river mouths and things like that, the organic levels will be very high. Um, next to a mangrove, it'll be very high. Next to a wetland, it would be very high. Um, uh, on a coral reef, they would tend to be very low, uh, comparatively speaking. So, okay, so key part here, composition of seawater, got water, got suspended stuff, then we got a bunch of different dissolved things. Of the dissolved things, major constituents, minor constituents, key things here for management are nutrients and gases, uh, and uh, to a lesser extent, organics, but we don't really, uh, we won't really touch much on organics in our class here. Okay, uh, next thing, uh, and one of the things that, that's easiest for you to observe, and this is one of the things we looked at with our experiment, is the uh, importance of ocean salinity, the importance of how much uh, salt is dissolved inside uh, a chunk of water. Now, uh, we, we just, is that good so far? Any questions, you guys? I'm going kind of fast. All good? I'm good. Okay. All right, so um, uh, with salinity, we're talking about the amount of salts per unit volume of water. Now, uh, we started, so a lot of this language that you see here that I've typed up for you comes from our legacy, uh, it mostly comes from the UK, where big empire all around the world, they're keeping books and all their stuff they're doing, and they have these, these what they call clerks, what we call clerks, uh, writing stuff down and they got tired of writing proportion how much how much 50 cents out of a pound or you know whatever so they developed a shorthand so instead of writing um, you know this number divided by this number they could just write one number and then write a percentage sign so when we write percentage it's one zero zero right out of a hundred what they did to, to save time is they didn't want to write because our hands are cramping up right they basically chopped off the one and zero. So they, they created the percent sign. It's a, it's a zero, a slash, and a zero. So anytime you see that you, in your mind, you add on 10 in front of that lowercase zero. So it's the, the percent out of 100. So using that same logic, if we were writing, instead of out of one in 100, if we were writing out of one in 1,000, we still chop off the 10, but now we have two zeros on the bottom, right? On the, on the denominator side of that fraction. And so that's what we use when we talk about 
the salinity of the ocean. So the salinity of the ocean, we traditionally talk about as, in, as being in parts per thousand. You could write that out and say parts per thousand. This is, this is usually calculated by weight. So you take the water, you, you, weigh, you weigh your, you know, this is how we originally did it, was we took the water, we weighed our volume, let all the, the water evaporate off, the salt remains, and then weigh the salt, right? And so, um, so you can either write, you can either say parts per thousand, just write it out, that's not wrong. You could say PPT, which is the abbreviation for parts per thousand. Or you could just do this, this thing that looks like a percentage sign, but it's funky, right? And that's also indicating parts per thousand. However you wanna do it, when we talk about the salinity of the, the average salinity of the ocean, of our global ocean, we're typically around 34, 35 parts per thousand. So that's, so if we talk, 35 parts per thousand is also known as 3.5%. So you could say it's 3.5% salts, but nobody does that. Do not do that. If I ask you on a quiz, what's the average salinity of the ocean? The answer is in parts per thousand, because that's what everybody says. Okay. So the typical range of, of surface waters um, would be somewhere between, I mean, they can, they can vary highly, but 33 to 37 is, is pretty typical. I, if, I, if I ask you for an answer, you should tell me 34 or 35 parts per thousand. Right? That's the best answer. Um, the salinity is really, really is going to vary quite a lot depending on if, if, say, we're at the surface of the ocean and we just had a big rainstorm, a bunch of fresh water dumped, and it's going to basically be fresh water on it. Uh, if we're near a big river mouth like the Yangtze or the, or the uh, Orinoco or the Amazon or the Mississippi or something like that, uh, if we're near the poles. So there's various things that, that, can, that can mess with salinity. But on average, the default is going to be around 35 parts per thousand. Some examples here, I've just put in some extreme examples. The Red Sea is really salty, about 42. Uh, so if you tasted it, it would, it would taste more salty, uh, just like the, the uh, Great Salt Lake would taste more salty than the ocean would. Um, uh, this one area in Finland that, that's essentially receiving all this freshwater runoff from these glaciers, glaciers melting, it's only about five parts per thousand. So it's, it's, it's almost fresh water, right? Even though we're in the, the, the ocean itself. The saltiest uh, surface water on Earth that's not created by people uh, intentionally is the Dead Sea, which is much, much saltier, right? So, so very hard for things to live in the Dead Sea. It's basically a, a, a salt soup. Um, and it's, I have it here at uh, 240 parts per thousand. Uh, I said back in the day, we weighed it by weight. Now we do salinity almost entirely by electrical conductance. So the more salt that's in there, the better, the, the, better, the faster the, the electrons are going to jump from, from point to point, from electrode to electrode. So we typically use that. We can also do refraction. If we were physically together, I would show you guys a refractometer, but, but it's OK. It's essentially using how light bends. Uh, that was first figured out by guys that were brewing beer, the people that made Guinness beer, uh, and they weren't they were initially looking at bricks, which is a measure of sugar content. They wanted to standardize beer production because they were starting to grow big and wanted to send it around the world and wanted to standardize the quality. And so I uh, figured out that, that more substances in the water make, made the light beams going in refract slightly differently. So they very precisely measured it. And they came up with this measure of bricks and then it was soon converted to measures of salt for salt water. And so you can use a, re a so-called refractometer. It doesn't need any batteries, anything else, and it'll, just, it'll tell you how salty the water is. And we can also calculate um, uh, the specific gravity is at a particular temperature, which if you have an aquarium, that's how sometimes people measure the saltiness. OK, um, getting close to pausing here, wrapping it up for right now. But uh, I'll just say that uh, all this stuff is starting to come together now. So all these things I just laid out are starting to begin to interact and start to manifest in different ways in the real world and therefore manifest in terms of some of our uh, management challenges and some of our the distribution of resources and, and how, we, how we manage those resources. So one of the, one of the first examples of this um, and why this stuff matters is the density of seawater. And so what I'm showing you here is, okay, so here's salinity, remember? So here's our parts per thousand. So here is, is uh, more like fresh water as we go this way, it's saltier and saltier and saltier, okay? And then here's temperature, starting with freezing or cold and getting warmer as we go up. These numbers here, this is the specific gravity. 
or, 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 or how dense, how dense the seawater is. And have a look. If we just pick a given salinity right now, let's, let's say the salinity was 33 uh, parts per thousand. And we started off at this temperature. If we started cooling it, if we took that water and put it into our refrigerator, let's say, so didn't, didn't, didn't add any water to it or anything, we capped it, right? We, we didn't take it away or add anything and just started changing the temperature and dropped down to 25 Celsius and then 20 Celsius and then 15 Celsius. Um, what's happening is the water is becoming denser, right? The specific gravity is increasing, right? So that this number is less than this number, right? So as we go down here, as we, as we maintain salinity, as we just change temperature, it's getting denser. Similarly, if we have water at a, at a given temperature, right? And let's say it's 31 parts per thousand, this one, and we start to, start to um, uh, sprinkle some salt in there from a salt shaker, what's gonna, what's gonna act to happen is it's gonna start to get more dense and more dense and more dense and more dense. We could go the opposite. We could warm up the water, you know, the same, same salinity, warm it up, it's gonna get less dense. We can't add fresh water so that, <clears throat> so that the saltiness goes down. And same thing, we start moving down this way and we the water is not as dense. Is that cool? Does that make sense? Everybody, with, everybody making sense with that? Or am I making sense, everybody, I should say? Yep. Yep. Yeah. No, I've killed everybody. Everybody's asleep. Wow. Wow, amazing. Um, okay, well, so I, I, we'll, we'll maybe just jam through these next couple of slides because it sounds like you guys are probably burnt out and not, not hearing much interaction from you guys. So, um, so I will just say that um, uh, th this density is really, really important for what goes on in the world. This is, this is a um, cartoon, a diagram of the uh, earth, okay? So here is the, um, the, the tropics. Here, here's the middle of the earth, right? Okay, so this is zero latitude. As we go up this way, we're getting to 30 degrees north, 60 degrees north, we're getting more towards the North Pole. Oops, sorry. As we go this way, we're getting more towards the South Pole, okay? And essentially what we tend to see is we tend to see at the poles a sinking of cold water, cold water dense, remember? So dense, so as it gets colder, it's denser, so it's gonna act to tend to sink. Uh, here, warm water near the, near the, um, uh, the tropics, uh, even though I mentioned before the water's moving around and all that kind of stuff, it's still going to tend to be warmer than a, at the poles. And so that stuff's going to tend to float and tend to sort of rise. So we get this general phenomenon of some areas of the water rising, some areas of, of the ocean rising, some sinking, etc. Now this is a very simplified version. This is sort of what, it, what if nothing else was happening? If we just had a, a stagnant earth, we'd see something like this. A pink nocline is a rapid, is a, is a is a uh, um, segregation of different waters of body. So a rapid change in, um, in this case, this is the density of water. So this, this body of water here is very different from this body of water. Um, and we'll see salinity starts to vary with latitude, okay? So, so in general, it's 35, right? Most of it said 35, 34. But there is a little bit of variation, right? As we go towards the, the poles where we tend to have more uh, uh, icebergs and glaciers and stuff like that melting, tends to be a little bit less dense. <clears throat> Evaporation and precipitation are also varying a lot. Now this is gonna get to do with something we're not gonna talk about right, quite yet, but about global circulation patterns leading to these things. Again, here we go. Here's the middle of the earth, right? And then as we go this way or this way, we're going poleward. And this is a, a, a gross cartoon, you know, gross patterns of where we have excessive evaporation, meaning water molecules are leaving the surface of the earth and turning into atmospheric, you know, gaseous water vapor. Yeah. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the stippled color here is where we're getting more uh, rainfall and we're adding water. And so what we see is, we, we start to see as we go polewards, we start to get bands where we have a really rainy band 
and then a really dry band and a really rainy band here, okay? So this is gonna act to sort of start to also add complexity to the salinity and therefore the density and therefore the movement and all that other stuff of, of our global ocean. Um, now, as you saw from your, as you saw from your ice cube melting, nothing else, not a fan, not, not blowing on your ice cube, just, just this, the, the fact that, that there was different salinity concentrations there, or, or better to say, different density amounts, that in and of itself will act to generate water movement, and it can generate a, a pretty amazing amount of water movement. And so only having evaporation, only having the sun strike the surface of a part of the coast or the ocean, and just having some rain, right, just those couple things, those in and of themselves can lead to a significant amount of movement of water. And so uh, and this, this is an example of this in the Mediterranean, right? Um, and uh, the Black Sea as well, which doesn't get a lot of exchange with the rest of the ocean, but it does get this, this circulation that can happen due to these differences in density. Uh, as things start to get more complex, we start to set up in the real world. Again, the real world is a three-dimensional surface. The Earth is a round or sort of a squished orange-shaped object. We start to see these things setting up. Now, this is surface circulation. There is circ there's three-dimensional three-dimensionality to all this, but we'll just, for simplicity's sake here, we'll just say there is um, uh, there are surface currents. And so this is the, how the water moves, the net water moves on the on the skin of the global ocean. And what we see here is we see some of these um, uh, a classic gyres. A gyre is just a large circulation, a consistent circulation over time uh, of a substance. It could be in the atmosphere, it could be in a liquid. Um, here we're talking about uh, the ocean water circulation, ocean water gyres. So we have the North Pacific gyre where water typically goes in a clockwise direction. Okay. Now, this is, again, a simple oversimplification. There's lots of noise and things in here, but generally speaking, on average, we're seeing it go that way. And it's exact reverse in the Southern Hemisphere. South Pacific Gyre does the same thing, but in the, the opposite direction. Same thing with Northern, the Northern Atlantic. We have the Gulf Stream blasting up around here. Uh, we have the Canary Current coming down here. Um, and the same thing here between Africa and uh, South America, et cetera. So all of this is being driven by the physics of water. And, and also the spinning of the earth, but, 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 but the physics of the water is the key underlying thing that allows this to happen in the way it's gonna happen. Um, and then this, this salinity also has some, some significant implications for critters, for organisms. So if we talk about, um, in, in, in this case, something like a freshwater fish versus a marine fish, um, they're, they're, they're breathing. They have these things called gills, these very soft tissues, very thin membrane tissues that are allowing the diffusion of gas. We mentioned there's a lot of gas dissolved in, in our water, right, in our, our global ocean. So they're essentially trying to suck that gas out. And so there's, they're, they're trying to suck the oxygen in because they're vertebrates, and they're trying to off-gas their waste products, their, their carbon dioxide. Uh, so, if you take a, does anybody have, a, anybody have aquarium fish? Anybody, anybody, maintain, anybody maintain a, a saltwater aquarium or a freshwater aquarium? On to my or have you ever done so? No, I had a turtle once. A <laughs> turtle. Okay, great. Uh, love it. Has anybody had a an aquatic tank with a with a fish in it? I have a hydroponics I pond in my backyard. Excellent, excellent, but no fish. I have a beta oh, fish. fish. Ooh, beta fish. Okay, so uh, does beta do betas live in salt water or fresh water? Um, fresh water. Yeah, fresh. I just <laughs> put it. <laughs> okay, okay. So now, um, so maybe so betas are kind of like you know these sort of fighting fish. He's he's kind of like rah, 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 fish. Um, but uh, so sometimes people you can get them cheap, and sometimes when they die, people are like oh well. But have you ever had to, have you ever treated any of those fish for parasites? Probably not. No, never. No. No, okay. Well, um, anybody else, anybody else have a, an aquarium that they, or aquarium fish? 
freshwater like a goldfish or a or a um or Turtle. a clownfish in a in a catfish and carp room. what's that catfish and carp okay catfish and carp so did you ever have um parasites on the catfish or carp yeah uh, i had this thing called anchor worms i think uh -huh. and then, uh, so how did you how did you treat them how did you get rid of the parasites well, uh, I went to these uh, Asian store uh, that sells fish, and then they said, use this, and I used it, and it got rid of it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. <laughs> so uh, if you're poor like me, uh, uh, poor, what I would do is I would use uh, a dip. So we sometimes call it a dip, <clears throat> right? So, so um, let's say we had a marine fish that had some parasites, an o a marine fish. And so, so a parasite on its gill might be a classic thing or something grabbing on the side of its body. Okay, um, we want to get rid of that parasite. What are we going to do? If we have a, if this is a saltwater fish, I can take that saltwater fish, I can make a little bucket of fresh water, pick that fish up, drop them in the fresh water. Fish isn't going to like it. Fish is going to go like, what the, he's going to say a lot of bad words. He's going to go like, what the bleepity bleep, right? Because um, he's going to be dying. Because his soft tissues in there are out of osmotic balance. So his gills are gonna to start to explode. So in effect, his lungs are gonna to start to explode. Um, and so, but, what you get, but what's gonna happen also is those parasites are also gonna be exploding. So if you do it right, you can take the fish out of the salt water, put it in the fresh water for just a second or two or three, four, five seconds, something like that. And then take it out of the fresh water, put it back in the salt water. And the fish can be like, ah, geez, ah, geez, ah, geez, ah, geez. right? You have a hard time breathing, he's like, you f me up kind of thing but if you do it right it'll definitely hurt the fish but it won't kill the fish and the fish can recover but it'll it'll tweak the parasites same thing with the reverse you have a freshwater fish you can do the same thing in salt water a salt water dip and 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 you have to know how to do it right so you can kill the fish and everything but but that's playing off of this idea of of how important salinity is so when these fish are moving around, if we're saying talking about an estuarine fish that, that's moving where it's sometimes salty and sometimes fresh, they really move relative to the amount of salt. So the, the changing amount of rainfall or whatever can actually absolutely shift major distributions of these organisms. And it's all because they've evolved to deal with and, and, they're, and they're osmotically, they're, 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 their um, physiology is such that they live in the salt or they live in the in the fresh. You and I have a hard skin, right? So you and I can put our hand in the ocean water and not be messed up. We can put our hand in the shower and not be messed up. But the, these um, organisms that have these very thin tissues, like the parasites, little invertebrates, or like a, a vertebrate, like a fish, but with the gills, that can be very problematic. Somebody had a question? No, okay. This is the last question, and then we're going to end it. I think we're just going to end it for today here, since uh, everything else has gone to hell in a handbasket today. So, okay, so here's my last question for you guys for today. Why is the ocean salty? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Is it because the ocean bed is filled with minerals? Uh, uh, sure, so, so absolutely. So there's minerals around. Okay, good. Okay, good. But um, so, so other, other ideas, other ideas. So minerals, what else might be making the ocean salty? I'm thinking the uh, runoff from Yes, rain. absolutely. Erosion. So rainfall in the desert, desert picks up some, some uh, you know, sediments and salt and stuff. And then that, that goes down the river and that river goes down that river and that river dumps in the ocean. Totally. Make sense? Any other, any other ideas? Maybe the comets that carried water from space from 4 billion years ago were full of salt. Okay, could be. Could be some other crash, bam, boom thing, bringing, bringing substances in, okay. Probably not, probably not uh, a lot, or at least after a certain period of time, probably not, but, but uh, okay. So basically, you guys are right. So basically, it's, it's this, this, these substances from the so-called weathering of the earth. So wind, rainfall, snow, freezing, all that kind of stuff, okay? And the person that first started working this out was the father of modern chemistry and was trying to figure this out. Um, and so said, so he worked out that, oh, it's salty because we've collected all these things you guys have just talked about. They went into the, the 
watersheds. The watersheds dumped them into a basin, and then they eventually got into the ocean basin. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so we'll just say that. So then I have a question. Uh, we also have volcanoes, underwater volcanoes that can contribute as well. Well, volcanoes in general, but especially underwater volcanoes could be blasting stuff, right? You can imagine squirting things into the, the um, body of the ocean. Um, and so this is what we see right here, right? We see erosion, river discharge, we see uh, um, uh, all, the, all the sulfurous rains and all that kind of good stuff. Okay, so my last question then, is why isn't it, why aren't we getting saltier? So if this is happening, there's erosion every day, right? There are somewhere around the earth, there's volcanoes going off all the time. Uh, Hawaii, it's a, uh, with, you know, the big island, it's a, been a continuous, inter, uh, continuous eruption for, I don't know what it is now, 20 years or something or 12 years or whatever. Um, so, so we have this constant input of stuff. Why isn't the ocean getting saltier? over time. I'll just say that when we first started measuring the salinity of the oceans you know, with modern instruments, you know, 150 years ago, it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed from then, since then. And when we use uh, uh, cool techniques to use um, uh, uh, ice and, and, and uh, 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 rock um, um, substances that we can go back in time to actually pretty accurately measure what the salinity was, it hasn't changed much, much in, in a long, 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 long time. So why, why hasn't it changed is my question. I'd say um, there's an output of salt coming out the ocean at the same time. Uh, okay, great. Uh, where's that salt coming out? We just talked about the fact that the sun's hitting it. So the water is evaporating, mm -hmm. right? So, so how are we getting the salt out of the you're right. So there has to be some kind of balance going on, right? So if we're adding all this, all these salts, all these substances all the time, what's what's taking those substances out? Probably isn't it with, with organisms in the Yes. Season? Ding, 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 ding. Life. Life is what does it. So we have all this stuff going on, and we're at essentially a steady state condition with our global ocean. This is what life is doing. So this are, th these are so-called deposits of biological precipitates, or precipitates. This is a map of, this is a generalized map of the ocean floor, okay? And uh, I haven't t defined these terms for you guys yet, but just don't worry about it. Neuritic is, is near, oceanic is far away, but check it out. What we see when we look around, in fact, you don't have to look at the you don't have to look at what it says down here at first. Just look at the colors, right? So we got some orangish color, burnt orangish colors up top, and around the edges, the margins of continents. Then we have these large areas of this uh, sort of tan color, yeah. And then we have this sort of out pocketing of some blue stuff and in, in, in sort of surrounding pockets of these um, of these uh, like tan colored things. What's going on is this. So check it out, right? So we have the, the, this circulation pattern, right? This, this relatively consistent movement of water masses over time, creating the structure. So we look at the ocean and we tend to think it's all the same. There's a huge amount of structure in the ocean, massive amount of structure. And one of the things it does is, is it produces patterns consistently over time. And that's what we're seeing here. So we're seeing things like clays here, okay? So that, that's, that's like uh, 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 dead rocks and things like that. But then we're seeing all this stuff like a calcareous ooze. Awesome, what a cool lecture. I get to give a lecture that says calcareous ooze. It's like Halloween's early. Um, and so calcareous uh, calcium carbonate. So this is, this is the, the structure that we use to make shells of of mussels, shells of coral, shells of, in this case, mostly floating planktonic critters, okay? And there's two different, I don't know if you, I don't know how well you guys can see this, but there's two different colors of this dark blue or whatever this uh, periwinkle, whatever the call, 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 color is. So we have this one color, and then we have some that are have triangles. Triangles, this word here is pronounced pteropod, the P is silent. So these are snails 
whose foot has evolved, instead of crawling along a surface, it's evolved to turn into a wing. And so pteropods are flying snails that live in the ocean. And we have some places where their concentrations are relatively large. We then have things, so we have calcareous ooze, we have silic silicaceous ooze. Ooh, wow, awesome. The two silicate uh, plankton critters that are the most abundant here are diatoms and radiolarians. Diatoms look like two, two halves of a glass petri dish. They're really pretty. They're, they're, they're much more pretty and complex than that, but sort of two valves. They have two valves that fit together. Radiolarians are this sort of spike ball. Imagine a soccer ball that had a bunch of, a bunch of sort of chopsticks sticking out of it, um, but all very small, of course. But uh, th those are radiolarians, and they concentrate in these equatorial uh, bands, right? So check out, like, this one's really cool. It's, it's on the equator, and then, bang, it smacks into South America, and it goes, bang, right? So that's what's going on. So life acts to create this static ocean in terms of the, the um, salts. So we have all these rinsings, all these uh, erosion, all this volcanic, boom, 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 boom. And then this is turning into biological precipitous. Check it out. Now we're starting to get into some resource management things, right? So now these are places where people want to go mine. These are places where people want to go extract the resource. These are places where productivity, this is telling us something about the productivity because where there's lots of phytoplankton and stuff like that in the water, there can be little critters that eat those phytoplankton, and then bigger critters, and then bigger critters. And pretty soon you get something big enough that you and I like to eat it. So again, all this is being driven by essentially the, the physics of the world ocean and determining where life is going to be optimal or where life wants to live. Okay, and with that, I'm going to